You know, I thought as Brother Kenny was praying, looking forward to the nations praising God, seeing that the Lord talks about the heavenly host being, uh, being a number that no man can number. And you know, every time you, you, if you watch one of these sporting events that's a big one, you know, if it's the Super Bowl or some championship game, they always tell you, before a sellout crowd of however many thousands of people, they always know the number. God said, I got a number that no man can number, right? <laughs> can you imagine being among the number that no man can number, praising and glorifying God? That's the way it ought to be. Amen. Um, let's go to Ephesians chapter 6 this morning. We're already doing that in spirit. One day we're going to see Him face to face and be just like Him. Oh, what a day. I want to talk to you. I just want to read a couple of verses to you this morning. We won't turn to the supporting passages that I have for time's sake. Um, but just, just to impress a thought upon our minds this morning, a phrase that I read the Apostle Paul saying, I had read it in one place and then came across it in another. And uh, it never jumped out at me before that he had used this phrase twice. But what I want to talk to you about it is, as I ought to speak. Twice the Apostle Paul says that. He asked for prayer that I might speak as I ought to speak. And the first place is in Ephesians chapter 6. We could definitely say more on this point, but um, I just want to consider these two verses and how the apostle twice identified his need to speak in a certain way as he declared the gospel. And so I want to ask that question, how ought we to speak? He asked for prayer concerning that first in Ephesians 6 and verse number 19. He says, well, 18 says, Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, the apostle says, pray for me too. What do you want prayer for, Paul? That utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth, how? Boldly. Boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel of God. Hold on, hold, on, hold on to that thought about making known the mystery of the gospel of God. We're going we're gonna to focus on that aspect of it a little bit more in the next text. But he says in verse 20, For which I am an ambassador in bonds, and there, that therein I may speak... Boldly. boldly as I ought to speak. So the first point is the Apostle Paul asked for prayer in declaring the Word of God that he might declare it how? Boldly. boldly. Twice he says that how ought we to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ? We ought to speak it boldly. Now I want to acknowledge something before I start this. There are times that we are called to be silent. Yeah. Right? That's right. Mm -hmm. Let every man be slow to speak. There are times swift to hear. There are times we're called to be silent. You know, Peter, when he was on the Mount of Transfiguration, when he didn't know what to say, you know what? He shouldn't have said anything, right? But this is my point. When God gives us a word to speak, when we have an opportunity to share the word of God and declare the gospel of Jesus Christ, when he gives us something to say, we ought to speak it boldly. And my prayer is that this will be an encouragement to us. I pray it will encourage our pastor as he's up here declaring the Word of God, God to us. We ought to declare the Word of God boldly. One of the prayers of the early church that we see in Acts chapter 4, again, for time's sake, don't go there, but you can look these up. This is in 29 through 31. They prayed, and now, Lord, behold their threatenings. This is after they had imprisoned Peter and John and then let them go. Behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by thy name, by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, it said the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And it says God was so pleased with that prayer, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Granted it right then and there. And that was their burden, that we would declare the word of God with boldness. So what hinders us declaring the word of God with boldness? First of all, no real experience. No real experience with the Lord will hinder you from declaring the Word of God boldly. If you're just a Christian in name, if you don't really know, what, what is it you say, brother? A, a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man that just has bare knowledge. I'm quoting that probably. A theory. A theory. A theory. There you go. He's got an experience. And because he has an experience, there's boldness in that which he says. Whenever we got back from the beach uh, to pick the dog up from the kennel, 
um, the lady that was working there began to tell us about how this German shepherd had jumped up on her and attacked her. And, and how she was afraid. She was hitting the dog out of her face and all. We didn't say anything to prompt that story. You know, we didn't ask her how did the dogs behave here or anything. This was fresh on her. She had had this experience. And, and it was an amazing experience. Sometimes the amazing experiences aren't necessarily good experiences, right? They're difficult experiences. But this thing stood out in her mind. And she was telling us, she was sharing this story with passion. You know why some people like passion and boldness when they declare the Word of God? Because they don't have any real experience with the God they're declaring. Amen. But if you've experienced this God, if you know this God, if He's personal to you, if He's amazing to you, you can't help but be bold when you talk about Him. Be bold in declaring the Word of God. If you don't have any boldness in declaring the Word of God, it just may be you don't have an experience with Him and you need to know this God. What else hinders boldness? Oh, well, I'm sorry, I had a verse to quote here. But Barnabas took him, that is, took Paul, and brought him to the apostles and declared unto them how he had seen the Lord in the way. That was a real experience of the apostle Paul. That's right. I was headlong despising Christians and wanting to kill Christians, and God stopped me in my tracks. And so he was sharing with them how he had seen the Lord in the way and that he had spoken to him and how he had preached boldly at Damascus in the name of Jesus. And he was with them coming in and going out at Jerusalem and he spake boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus and disputed against the Grecians, but they went about to slay him. Why did he speak boldly? Because he had had an experience with God. And he was continuing to experience God. It's not a one-time experience either, is it? We continue to experience Him when we grow in grace and the knowledge of Christ our Lord. The last part of that text there, how it says when He preached boldly, and that was Acts 9, 27 through 29. It says they went about to slay Him. That kind of identifies the next thing that will hinder our boldness. And that is fear. That's another obstacle that we will encounter when it comes to declaring the Word of God as we ought to declare it. And that is boldly. Fear will stop us in our tracks. In John 7, 13, it says, When they were amazed by Christ and what He had done, it said, Howbeit no man spake openly. That's the word boldly right there. It's the same Greek word. No man spake boldly of Him for fear of the Jews. Fear stopped them in their tracks. Fear will hinder us from speaking as we ought to speak. It will choke out that boldness. But I want you to know, if we have been saved, if we have a true experience with the Lord, then we have been well equipped by the Spirit to overcome this obstacle. It's not that we won't be tempted in this area, but we've been equipped to overcome it. 2 Timothy 1, 7-8 says, For God has not given us the spirit of fear. And that word could be better translated timidity. And God hasn't given us a spirit that we should be timid in declaring His truth. But listen to this. But He's given us instead the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me His prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. There will no doubt be resistance as we declare the Word of God. But God has called us not to fear, but to recognize He has given us the spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. And so don't shy away from that. I do have one verse I want to read. You can turn there because I didn't jot it down in my notes. Acts chapter 4. I want to show you something that will help you in fighting this fear, this obstacle. Acts chapter 4 and verse number 13. And this is actually just prior to the text where they had prayed for boldness. Why did they pray for boldness? Because there was that temptation to fear after the apostles had been locked up and beaten and forbidden to preach in this name anymore. But listen to what it says in Acts 4.13 concerning Peter and John. Now, when they saw the what? Boldness. The boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, they marveled. Where did they get this boldness from? The last, latter part of the verse tells us, and they took knowledge of them that they had what? Been with Jesus. Been with Jesus. You know what will help you overcome that fear and encourage that boldness? Yeah. Is to spend time with Jesus Christ. 
The more we spend time with Him, the more we stand in amazement of Him. The more we can't help but declare Him, right? The more we have those experiences that we share from us. Look at what God's done to me. Look at what God has spoken to me. Look at how Christ has revealed Himself to me. Spending time with Christ is a deterrent of that inordinate fear. All right, the second part of this is Colossians 4. The apostle said, pray for me that I would speak the word of God as I ought to speak. That is to speak it boldly. And then he asked for prayer also in Colossians chapter 4. In verse number 3. With all praying also for us. He told them this is very similar to what we have in Ephesians. He tells them to continue in prayer in verse 2. And then he says, I've got a specific request for us. With all praying also for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ. He uses that term again. For which I am also in bonds that I may make it what? Manifest. Manifest. And what he says it again, as I ought to speak. So two things I want to impress upon you. How ought we to speak the Word of God? We ought to speak it boldly and we ought to speak it manifestly. So we need to understand what that means, right? What does it mean to speak the Word of God manifestly? Strong says this means to render apparent, whether literally or figuratively. Uh, it can be, a synonym would be appear, Manifestly declare, to make manifest, to make manifest forth, to show. And it comes directly from a word meaning shining. And if you trace it all the way back, it can be traced all the way back to the root word meaning simply light. In other words, this means to make it clear by bringing it to light. That's what he says when he, when he says, Pray for me that I would declare the Word of God manifestly, that I would make it clear, that I would bring it to light. That's what the word manifest means. Here's a text that shows you what it means. It's got our word in there. It's going to use the word manifest. Listen to this, 1 Corinthians 4, 5. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come, who both will bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. And then shall every man have praise of God. So that shows us that's what this word means. It means bringing it to light. It means making it clear. Alright? Well, what hinders clarity with declaring the Word of God? What are hindrances to that? If we ought to make the Word of God clear, what hinders that clarity? Guess what? It's the same exact things that you see with boldness. Many have no light because they have no life. And so how can you make clear that which isn't even clear to you? Again, the first problem is no real experience with the Lord, right? Not even being saved. Uh, 2 Corinthians 4 and verse number 10 and 11 says, Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. It might be clear in our body. For, which, for we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. How can it be made manifest? Because God granted us life. And if God gives you life, then you have light. And if you are light, then you're able to make things clear. So that's a hindrance to speaking manifestly. Again, if that's the issue with your clarity, run to Jesus Christ. Understand that you need to know this God that you're telling. Some of us have grown up in church and we just know we're supposed to do these things. But why does it always feel weak and, you know, I just I don't, I always get confused and jumbled. Sometimes it's just because we've never really been saved. It's more than just a name. It's an experience. It's knowing this God that they may know thee, Jesus said in John 17. All right, But listen, if you have been saved, if you have been given life, then guess what you are? You are the light of the world. Right? Isn't that what Jesus said? Didn't Jesus said, say, I am come a light into the world? And then He turns around to His disciples later and says, You are the light of the world. That means you make things clear. Right? Isn't that what light does? Ephesians 5.13 says, But all things that are reproved are made manifest by the light. For whatsoever doth make manifest is light. Alright? So you are light. Again, you're well equipped. But guess what's an obstacle to making things clear? Same problem we had before. Fear. Fear hinders us in making things clear at times. But ev so even if we are light, Jesus says in Matthew 5.16, What? Let your light so... 
shine before men that they might see your good works and do what? Glorify your Father in heaven. Light makes things clear, and so we have a responsibility to let that light shine. Fear is why we beat around the bush sometimes and don't make things clear by speaking directly. Can anybody else agree? I've done that. Yeah. I'm so concerned about how they're going to respond to this and how do I say it the right way. Blah, 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 blah. When if I would just come out and speak directly what I'm thinking, there wouldn't have been any lack of clarity to it. If we remember God's mercy on us and how He made things clear to us, then our desire should be to make things clear to others as we let our light so shine. It says, of concerning Jesus Christ, He verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. That's 1 Peter 1.20. Titus 1.3 says, But hath in due times manifested His word through preaching, brought these things to light, which is committed unto me according to the commandment of God our Savior. So how do we combat this fear in being uh, that hinders clarity, hinders that light shining? 1 Peter 3, 14 and 15 says this, But and if you suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. That text just said, don't be afraid of them, but declare the word of God to them with meekness and fear. What does that mean? It means we replace inordinate fear with proper fear. Right? Mm -hmm. Then what's the proper fear? It's the fear of the Lord. Amen? So fear is a hindrance here, but when that improper, inordinate fear is replaced with proper fear, then we're able, we're ready to give an answer to every man. Again, we have the same problem here that we had in the last one. Uh, what will help us to overcome fear? Spending time with Jesus Christ. Same exact thing. Look at 1 Timothy 4, and we will... Um, I want to read this and then one other text and we'll be done. 1 Timothy 4, spending time with Christ. How do we, how do we act that out? How is that accomplished? What does that mean to spend time with Christ? Well, it means to spend time in prayer with Him, right? It means to be deliberate in spending time in prayer and in study of His Word and meditation upon His Word. That, that's drawing near to God in our hearts and considering Him. Listen, when Mike and Alyssa got married this weekend, um, I knew they were about to move off, and I don't know. I, I don't know if they're coming back or not. You know, we'll see. But it's like you're trying to take advantage of every moment that you have because you don't know when you're going to see them again. Yeah. We ought to take advantage of every opportunity we have to spend time with the Lord. They were bold because they had been with Jesus. We will be clear when we've been with Jesus. 1 Timothy 4 and verse number 13 the Apostle encourages Timothy, he says, Neglect not the gift that is in thee which was given thee by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the presbytery. Meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them that thy profiting may appear to all. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine continuing them for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. This will work towards that clarity, that light shining forth. 2 Corinthians 2.17 says this, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God. That word corrupt there means to peddle, to retell the word of God. The world has seen that over and over and over again. Men that have used the word of God for their own gain. Retelling the word of God, peddling the word of God so that they can get some benefit from it. I work with a guy that he, he, his email says that he's J.J. the skeptic. And that's a big part of that skepticism. He's just seen people over and over again using the Word of God for their own gains. The Apostle Paul said, we don't, we're not like them that corrupt, that peddle or retell the Word of God. This is what I pray that people would see in us. But as of sincerity, but as of God in the sight of God, speak we in Christ. That they would see in us as we speak God's Word, they would see boldness and clarity. Speaking in sincerity because we are aware that we speak in the sight of God.